You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Revision Path. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. I'm your host, Maurice Cherry. And before we proceed, let's thank our sponsor for this episode, Facebook Design. To learn more about how the Facebook design community is designing for human needs at unprecedented scale, please visit facebook.design. Now for this week's interview. I'm talking with Noble Ackerson, a senior product manager and self-proclaimed recovering startup founder in the DMV area. Let's start the show. All right. So tell us who you are and what you do. Uh, First, thanks for inviting me, Maurice. Uh, I'm Noble Ackerson, a senior product manager at Ventera Corporation, Virginia. Now, before we get, you know, more into what you do and your background, just tell me, like, how are you holding up right now? Uh, Same as most people, sheltering in place, working from home, being a, you know, moonlighting as a as a teacher for a two-year-old and a five-year-old, and so we're we're maintaining. It's tough, like with everyone else, but but we're 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 we're, we're motivating each other, and we're we're hanging in there. Let's talk about your work a little bit at Ventera. Like, what do your work days look like now? One hundred percent remote, and it's actually counterintuitive than what I thought I would say if you'd asked me this. Hey, what would happen if you are you you moved one hundred remote, one hundred percent remote? on this program, I would have said it's isolating and, and, and it's tough. But day to day, I find that the constant, you know, Zoom or WebEx or video calls uh, have caused me to connect more with my team, mm-hmm. uh, my customers, because uh, we're, we're all in tune. We're all going through it together. So we, we, we just sort of check in on each other a whole lot more. And obviously we're on meetings 100% of the day, work day. So we see each other more. I th- I th- if there's any silver lining, I think it's, uh, it's it's been generally positive. That's a good thing. I mean, the fact that you're able to be closer in this kind of situation. Right. How did you first get started at Ventera? I left a nonprofit that I really felt passionate about, uh, the National Democratic Institute. It was the it was basically the confluence of my perfect job, right? But it was just a sabbatical, and it was due to end, so I had to leave. It was essentially I was both a product lead, I had a product, and an engineering lead, um, but it was in a startup within an, a nonprofit, which is normally unheard of. Uh, that focused on innovation with with you know 55 plus countries around the world that were needing technology services to verify the uh, quality of their elections, uh, working on under with underrepresented groups in different countries, and just doing some really really cool stuff with data governance, uh, AI, just. Really, really cool projects uh, on that. And I left there to join Ventera, uh, similarly to to help a major government agency to improve the lives of patients and residents around the country. So your grandma living at a in a nursing home or uh, a patient, uh, a, a provider, you know, providing services for a home health agency, those kind of customers. And for years, uh, they have been using, maybe for two decades, they've been using this antiquated desktop class system that is bifurcated. And my job is to improve the lives of those who protect the ones we love through technology and bringing it to the web. Uh, And it's been very, very rewarding for me. And I would imagine, like, especially at this current time, it's probably even pretty like rewarding and fulfilling in that respect, because now the work that you're doing, I mean, of course, it's helping patients, but at a critical time like this, it's even more important. Absolutely. The world got turned upside down for a lot of people. But as you, if you've been following in the news, those at risk are, are the providers and the surveyors and people who are making sure that, you know, our loved ones aren't infected by this virus. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and aren't in danger. And so more and more of the work that we do and the issues that we're seeing today with this pandemic has become a whole lot more relevant, I guess, for, for everyone on the team. What drew you to that kind of work to kind of be able to use your skills and I don't want to say in a humanitarian way, but to be able to use your skills in, in such a, a public facing forward way that maybe is not sexy, I guess. That's kind of a weird way to put it. But like it's something that I've mentioned on the show before, how oftentimes, you know, product designers or such will go into working for a company because they want to have a specific title, but not necessarily because the work that they do really helps people. I'm yeah. curious to kind of know, like, what made you go that route with your skills? Yeah, I came to this is a very good question because I came to a point in my my career. I, I started a founded a startup, and we can talk about that too. And after that attempt at launching a product from zero to not to zero to one, I decided to pivot. It's actually why I was at that nonprofit we just spoke about to see how I could use my skills to to help out in areas that needed it the most. At Ventera, this specific project spoke to me more because my dad for years owned a home health agency. It's just like a, a delivered prescriptions to people who were who lack mobility, who are older, those kind of things. A lot of the pitch, I guess, when that opportunity came around, just um, hit home. And so just moving from helping folks that needed the help the most around the world uh, with a massive organization like the National Democratic Institute and moving to an enterprise application that almost did the same thing, helping people through tech, Mm -hmm. have these philosophies about product that are a little counterintuitive for somebody who who lived maybe seven or eight years in emerging tech that says basically the technology doesn't really matter. Solving the problems really does. That's the philosophy. And and, and Mm. what can I do to abstract the tech from solving specific needs is, is paramount for me. And so the opportunity to work on a modernization project when you're going from literally mainframe systems to the web seems very, you know, status quo, but sort of coupled with the types of people that would benefit from accurate data coming out of that, say, you know, you know, helping save lives that way really means more to me than the old, no offense to um, anyone you know, working on just anything and claiming we're changing the world. But I can actually say that if I don't do my job right, you know, my loved one might be in danger. Yeah. And that's what brings me there. What made you decide to take the sabbatical at NDI? Like, was there something specific about their mission or vision that spoke to you? On the face stuff, the top of the funnel stuff, like the mission spoke to me. But to be honest, I was tired. I worked in a startup for years and then I had my daughter, you know, working in a startup as a founder is say the least just stressful and lonely because you, you, as a founder, you have to have all the answers and, and all that stuff. So I was kind of tired of that. We got aqua hired by a larger startup in the DC metro region. Uh, my team did. And that grind was also taxing. So I decided to take a break from pushing product in the enterprise and, and the consumer space for a little bit and go help. The transition wasn't as sort of a flip of a switch like that. Yeah. I actually took a break from Apex Labs, where the, the company that Aqua hired my team and committed my time to helping underrepresented founders like me that would go through the trials of being told, oh, go raise an angel f- uh, of friends and family around. And I'm thinking to myself, like, my friends or my family, we don't have that 25 grand. Like, out of yeah. where am I going to get that? So for several months, maybe a year, if you were a founder in emerging tech specifically or in an innovative space that I that spoke to me, you probably got a call from me or you probably reached out to me and I responded and I was either mentoring you or, or on your board kind of thing. So that sort of pivot was due to just frustrations with, you know, Silicon Valley and again, no offense to Silicon Valley, but just that grind of, of just, you know, move fast and break things kind of thing. I, I figured if I was going to do anything, bring some of that to nonprofits and helping uh, organizations. What did working there teach you? Working at the nonprofit? Yeah. 
<laughs> well, one, it taught me that uh, office politics does not stop when you leave <laughs> <laughs> the tech space and bureaucracy and, and all that stuff isn't a walk in the park when you come to nonprofits. But it did teach me that as a product person first and someone with my background, that if I did what I could to stand out, have the conviction to stick to my morals and and ethics around whatever the mission was, speak out more, even though some may think that might you know, you, speak, you talk too much, you know, that kind of stuff. I learned that I, I doubled down on that core belief that being open, being continuously learning does not. And there's one uh, when you come into nonprofits and larger ones like the National Democratic Institute. Uh, innovation doesn't really matter if you don't have a you don't tune in to your customers. So that would be my second piece of uh, learning. There's a constant regardless of what industry I've been, and it was definitely learned again in nonprofits, that uh, the two things that are constants, one, whether being in IoT, ed tech, whatever, startups, being in tune with the user's feedback and maybe behavioral trends, and also delivering value as a second constant to my business and my users doesn't change, right? Mm -hmm. Just how you deliver it changes. So... That definitely spoke to me because uh, I went in the nonprofit thinking, oh, man, they, they're not going to be able to change. And But just speaking out over time, you build trust and you, you start changing minds uh, yeah. and you can do some pretty powerful things. Now, let's kind of switch gears here a little bit. You know, I was doing my my research on you before the interview and I saw that you were were born in England. Yeah. Did you grow up there? Part of my life, I also grew up a little bit in West Africa, Ghana. So I was born in England, uh, moved to West Africa, Ghana, and then moved to the U.S. Lived with my grandparents out there in the U.K., lived with my grandparents again in in Ghana, and then lived with my parents out here in the U.S. Okay. Okay. Also, you grew up in the the DMV area, too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. High school. Was technology like a big part of like your childhood and growing up? Were you exposed to it? Kind of, but by happenstance. So we weren't well off. My parents weren't well off. And my dad, my late father, was was obsessed with garage sales. <laughs> <laughs> and so we would spend weekends going, you know, around the different neighborhoods. And whenever he would see like computer parts or just computers, he'd bring it home. And the sad part about that practice, that tradition was that he wasn't good with computers at all. He didn't know what a mouse was. He'd ask you to kill it if you asked him to go grab a mouse. And so what would happen is we would have a whole bunch of technology in the garage and I would get bored and I'd have to start putting it together. So that actually sort of fixing PCs or putting them together and then eventually building my own sort of got me into that sort of flexing that left brain a little bit more. Mm-hmm. But I didn't start out as a technocrat. Like I was more the right brain kind, like this is a creative. I was in architecture focused in in high school, a a very good high school out here in Northern Virginia, good science program. But they had a drafting class, architecture class. And that's basically where my heart sang. And even that, I found myself just tweaking software up a little bit and and figuring things out. And so before you know it, I I basically pivoted. And uh, I see you went to the University of Lynchburg in Virginia. What was that experience like? Did it help like prepare you once you got out there in the working world? Man, quick story about that. So I was <laughs> for, for a black person, man, like <laughs> I got to back that up a little bit. Okay. <laughs> I, I love that college for, for, for some reasons. And, and I, I should qualify that uh, I love it so much. I'm actually on the alumni board there. Okay. Uh, but I'll explain why. Lynchburg. Before I got to Lynchburg, I'm talking like a week to accepting the Lynchburg College thing. I had my bumper stickers and my hoodie, all that stuff for Virginia Tech. I was mm-hmm. going to be a hooky through and through. I had already accepted for that school, for that university in, in, in Blacksburg, Virginia, yeah, Virginia Tech. And Lynchburg was very aggressive with me. They came with a presidential scholarship and, and 
my parents, you know, weighed it. It's private school, you know, and and so they weighed it and, and gave me the choice. And I said, all right, fine, I'll, I'll leave the large school because I went to a very large high school. So I decided to balance it out by going to a smaller, at the time it was Lynchburg College. They just switched the name to university because they're growing. And so that was, as far as it, whether it prepared me, uh, now that I told the story, it certainly did. Lynchburg was one of those sleeper schools for computer science students. Uh, they had an endowment from, the, uh, from Bill Gates, I believe. They had a very impressive uh, computer science department. And, you know, I actually went to minor in neural networks and artificial intelligence. Is, uh, mm-hmm. Computer science is my major in neural networks. This is during the AI desert or whatever, whatever they call it. And I'm a little older, so 1998 through 2002. Okay. And so they were pushing the boundaries. My AI class changed curriculums like twice in a semester because that's how wow. nascent it had gone through its cycles. And I was during that trough of uh, disillusionment, if you want to call it. And so it definitely, all these pieces sort of build up to who we are today with some of these little decisions that we make. And, and, and Lynchburg definitely played a role in that. So what was your first kind of like job out of undergrad where you were like really working and what you were studying? Yeah. So in undergrad, I was an IT technician. So I worked in their IT ops office and I would be the person to set up your computer when you were a freshman coming in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that wasn't making me enough money, even though I was making more money than the folks at the library and at the, uh, on the grounds. I was proud of that. But I'm African. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we just like to work uh, yeah. and, and study. Yeah. For me, maybe work more than study. So I, I actually took up another opportunity that came my way, which was basically a coach uh, for this program called Tech Writers. And Tech Writers was just a program funded by now Senior Senator of Virginia, uh, Mark R. Warner. And what he did was he partnered with AOL to provide equipment and software and other companies to go help underrepresented folks that don't have, the, the, the mission was to bridge the technology divide, right? We would sort of put together a whole bunch of smart students, a bunch of industry professionals, bring them together, go to a place of worship, working with the the deacon or whoever at the, at the church. We'll come there on a Saturday. We would train people uh, on how to use Microsoft Word or PowerPoint and stuff like that, mm-hmm. and just coach them on all that stuff. So I ended up becoming the the trainer of the trainers. And through that got me into my first job. Uh, once this industry, you know, tech industry millionaire guy decided he wanted to run for governor, I guess it would have been in 2000, it would have been his second time, the first time he, 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 he lost. And so my first job out of undergrad was the technology guy. I think that was my title. <laughs> so okay. it was basically... Every, anything from fixing printers to, you know, building one of the first websites for a political campaign. And I still have an article on my wall here that I'm looking at that had a store. So they brought some e-commerce to it. Uh, and, and Mark Warner's gubernatorial campaign in 2001 was the first. I think this is a New York Times article I'm looking at here. Anybody wants to go look that up? Yeah, we built the first website that didn't suck, I guess. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, especially when you think about how technology plays such a role in campaigns and and how politicians are using it now. Like People thought Obama was, was revolutionary when he was doing it for his first campaign run, but you were doing it all the way back in 2001? Yeah, yeah, it's funny because... After that success, after he trounced, I forget the, the other candidate, we moved in. You know, I, I was basically part of that family. Uh, I went to work for his administration in Richmond, Virginia, as a technology liaison there. Uh, and then after his ter- uh, his term, he called me back in 2000, London. I was about to go back to Berkeley College, University of London to, to do uh, continue my studies. But I got a phone call from his right hand man and they're like, hey, we're thinking about running for president. We're going to do a political action committee. This was you talked about Obama. This sort of reminded me about this story. 
So, uh, you know, they convinced me to come back. I was going to be director of technology. I'm like young as hell. So I show up and we talk about how Obama was innovative, but a lot of the team members, the smart, talented individuals that made up that team came from Howard Dean's campaign. If you remember the, the Howard Dean yeah. the podium. Yeah. So Howard Dean's campaign, we poached a lot of, once his campaign sort of fell, fell apart, we poached a lot of his uh, developers that were centralized in Austin. A lot of them have gone to build great things like Vox Media. The, 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 the shout out to Trey, who's the CTO at Vox. Oh, I know Trey. Trey Brundett, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trey yeah. Um, yeah. And so a lot of those, you know, we put that PAC, political action uh, com- committee, up uh, you know, uh, on the back of, of the Dean campaign. Of course, Warner never ran, if you remember, uh, in the end. But a lot of those, that talent went to the Hillary campaign and the Obama campaign. That's where innovation started happening in that space. Wow. Now, I have a story because <laughs> it's it sort yeah, of yeah. is like a bit of a, I guess, kind of a corollary to what you're talking about. So when I started my studio in uh, like late 2008, early 2009, I got really inspired by Obama and I quit my job, one, because I was inspired by Obama, but two, because they owed me like $3,000 and back pay, which I finally got cleared. And once it cleared, I quit that same day and used that as seed money to start my studio. But the first big client that I had was in 2009, and it was for a mayoral candidate here in Atlanta. And it was kind of the first set of municipal races after Obama, where like now you have even local politicians being like, how do we get some of that? Like, how do we get some of that that Obama effect with technology and things like that. And so I was really fortunate to work on a campaign where we were really kind of innovating in a lot of ways because there was no blueprint as to how to do this. Like, how do you take technology, particularly social media, and really use it within a campaign? I mean, we had our candidate on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn. She was also on MySpace to let you know how long ago this was. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we had found we found someone on Black Planet who does custom MySpace designs mm. to do her MySpace page. My God. <laughs> but it was so interesting, like trying to navigate that space doing tech and new media for politics in a in a time when nobody knew what they were doing. Like, I mean, now of course technology and politics are like hand in glove with so many things, both good and bad. But back then it was so weird, like trying to explain to the candidate, like just because you have 4,000 Twitter followers, that doesn't necessarily mean you have 4,000 votes. Like it's another tool in the campaign toolbox for outreach, but it's not a direct one-to-one correlation with voters. And unfortunately the candidate did not win, but that ended up getting me in front of so many other people that were like, we saw the work that you did for her campaign. And how do we do that for our nonprofit? How do we do that for our small business, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in a way, the work that you did kind of like paved that for other races and other candidates to kind of start doing that, including me doing it for this mayoral candidate. That's awesome. (laughs) So I guess like while all of this is going on, this is when you knew like for a fact, like I could do this for a living. Like this is what I can do. Yeah. So from that, there was a market. It's like the political nonprofit slash political action committee slash small business space. So say, for example, you're looking to help out a campaign, do their, you know, their their net roots stuff, they used to call it. I don't even know what they still do. Uh, (laughs) Would mean you would need to, you would probably hit me up. And I would have sort of sat in there, sold you a bunch of software, partnered with other service providers, NGP Van, that kind of stuff, just CRMs and, 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 and stuff for your finance team, stuff for your website, all that stuff. Or we could just build it for you. Before you knew it, like campaigns come and go. But I realized that in the U.S. there was always a campaign. And so my first startup, it was based on that, I identified a need which was basically, there's always a campaign. The campaigns that are wrapping up, like almost always, whether they win or lose, want to just offload equipment, furniture, lease the space, that kind of stuff. And then the campaigns, you know, halfway across the country that were 
getting ready for the next November or whatever, were looking to buy things on the cheap because they hadn't raised money yet. You know, so my first startup was a company called Campshare that was a logistics company on at the back, you know, below the the iceberg, right? Like, but on the top, mm-hmm. it's just basically like the eBay. The pitch was like, you don't want it's eBay for uh, for political campaigns and nonprofits because you don't want to. As a candidate, you don't want to have to buy a bunch of chairs and find out, you know, you bought it from, you know, a Ponza porn star or something like that. Like, so, <laughs> you know, that would just tank your campaign. So we would vet the and, and basically be that conduit between campaigns that were closing, campaigns that were, were opening. So mm-hmm. it basically got me into product in a weird way by just trying and in that case, failing and learning a lot about, you know, how to run a business one and then two, how to today I can say how to make a product succeed. That's basically, yeah, that's a good question. So the startup that you mentioned, was this the the first of many startups that you worked on? Oh yeah, man. Like I, I was just, you know, I had an audience. I had a market that I had worked on for so long since 2001, 2000, that I knew their needs through and through. So even if it was just to, to supplement uh, you know, my income, because I wasn't really, I didn't really need to look for a job, like a traditional office job. And so my guy incorporated, got a good, got a good CPA and all that and started uh, something called a company, self-aggrandizing sounding, but a company called A Noble World. And it was okay. basically a, a company that was targeted towards PACs, towards political organization and small businesses. And so we would do things like before the, the modernization jargon came into play, we would we would try to fund certain initiatives that we're trying to like that campshare startup was funded off the back of just going to organization to organization, asking them to digitize their their reams of paper that their finance teams left. So we would rent a U-Haul van, van slap our logo, bought a little um, magnetic logo thing from a local banner store. Uh, drive up there. We had this Fujitsu. I remember we had this Fujitsu scanner that I saved up and bought and we would just set it up and just start scanning things. And, you know, we would charge by paper, you know, so a couple cents for every paper that we would, you know, a fraction of a cent for every paper that we would, we would scan. Uh, and, and, and that's how we would monetize all the crazy ideas that we had. Wow. Now, another startup idea I, I saw uh, you did was something called LinksFit. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so LinksFit is probably my proudest um, moment as a startup founder. LinksFit, prior to that, uh, I was fortunate enough to be invited to Google and, and work with their marketing team to to understand how to release that Google Glass product to the market. Uh, as part of that group, my CTO and I, who was also part of that um, sort of pre-release group, that were made up of initially non-Googlers. My CTO is still at Google now. We would go in and and we sort of try out the devices, think up different ways that would, you know, different personas or, or target audiences that, that we would want to target. All this at the time was NDA, test statute of limitations of long past. So. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was fun. Uh, they organized, Google organized the first hackathon in New York and in L- in San Francisco, I believe. Around that time, I was uh, in that inaugural group. Uh, this is before Glass was out in the market. And through that, I got my hands on the device. I was already drinking Google's Kool-Aid. If you had asked me back in 2011, 2012, I would have said, look, in 2020, there won't be a thing called COVID, but every single person will have a face computer. <laughs> if you went to the optometrist, you could just you know, add more tech to your regular prescriptions, right? Like that was how much I believed in the future of wearable tech had worn assistive reality, assisted reality as, as my colleague calls it. And so that whole Kool-Aid drinking sort of gave me a lot of ideas as to, to where things were. If I was smart, uh, in hindsight, I would have started in the enterprise space. But I actually started, I prototyped an idea using the glass API, the mirror API, to track fitness. It was very simple. It would show you a within your field of view a workout to do and it would just count down until you were done. 
It didn't use any sensors. But convinced a lot of people that there was a there there. And mm-hmm. it convinced me in retrospect. And so uh, we decided, you know what, that's my future. I'm going to get into computer vision. I'm going to get into AR. Of course, Glass launched and it wasn't really fully AR. Actually, it wasn't AR at all. It had capabilities to be augmented reality uh, focused. And so we doubled down on it. So LinksFit, the whole goal of LinksFit was to give you a virtual coach, uh, a virtual coach that would tap into the sensor fusion of a wearable device. So if you don't know, Glass was basically a Nexus phone miniaturized uh, or stripped out and form fitted in a very, very compact wearable device that was light uh, and was balanced out so it didn't weigh too much when you wore it seemingly. Okay. Uh, And so we tried this out. Uh, We took this out, tried to find customers. We, our target audience at the time were physical health sort of rehabilitation PR customers and fitness coaches and, and gyms, that kind of stuff. And then and we prototyped it, gave it all away for free, which I would never do or advise any startup founder to do, especially with emerging tech. And it became something. We won a lot of awards. Uh, we sold uh, our software. We actually made money. But we also ran out of money when we found out, well, due to the fact that Glass never hit the market, we were overly focused on the success of our partner in Google. Later in the success of the copycats, uh, we had partnered with Samsung, LG, and Sony as well. They also uh, may or may not at the time have had competing devices ready to launch, but they never did. And so uh, we, we ac- you know, access to the devices was pretty much the downfall of was the primary downfall of, of LinksFit. Uh, and so we sold the company before. Well, after I ran out of payroll and we were wondering where the next paycheck was going to come from. Uh, and so <laughs> and so uh, uh, that's the story of LinksFit. Uh, it, it was Northern Virginia's most innovative company. Won an award there. Washington Post's most innovative company. Nice. Won an award there. You would have seen a lot of media chatter on it whenever they talked about fitness and wearables. Our name, we even had copycats out of England call mm-hmm. themselves the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, it was great. Do you still use the Google Glass? Specialty purposes. As I mentioned, I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old, so I've been using it consistently with them whenever they're out in the playground. So when a quick story on that, when my daughter was able to walk and, and go on a swing in the play, at a playground, I would, at the time, Glass was like the only thing I cared about. So I, would, I wouldn't even carry my phone. I'd just sort of slap the thing on my face. And every time she would start swinging, I would take a video and a picture. So, you know, as I let her go, I'll take one picture. And as she came back, I'll take a video. So as she swung, I'd take a you know 30 second video. Mm-hmm. Every single time she did that, I would take a picture and a video. And I kept that up. If, you know, it was safe to take her to the playground today, I'd still be doing it. The goal in my feeble brain has been that if she's old enough and she's maybe about to get married or or have a a very big milestone, I would then take the time to find every single picture and video, splice it up into a montage. And as I let her go, as I push her off, she's a baby. And when she comes back from the swing, she's an adult. And so it would just be a stop motion kind of thing. And that's what I... And that's what I'm hoping to accomplish. That's why I still use Glass. Oh, nice. No, that's that sounds really dope to be able to use it for something like that. Yep. I hope it, I, I remember to do that someday. So let's let's talk more about wearable tech. I mean, you mentioned Google Glass not taking off. And I remember when it was first coming out, I know the cost was a, a very prohibitive thing for a lot of people. But then just like the general look, because they're, they're glasses, but they're not really glasses. It's kind of just like a like an eyepiece in a way. But like now wearable tech is super common. I mean, I think mostly in part because of the Apple watch and we've seen other, you know, smart watches from other manufacturers. We've got other smart glasses in the vein of Google glass, like the snap spectacles. Uh, I think I see some from Bose that are, they're not, 
they're not necessarily smart glasses, but they have access to the Google Assistant. So like yeah. you can hear through like bone conduction, some some interesting technology or something like that. But then you also see smart bracelets, of course, Fitbit, things like that. There's smart rings, there's smart jewelry of other kinds, pendants, etc. And as I mentioned to you before we started recording, like I feel like one of the biggest wearable tech implementations of the past 10 years have been body cams, whether they've been for use for law enforcement or people just doing like you're using it in a way to sort of capture a moment very quickly. Like, what do you think about wearable tech and its place in society now? Wearable tech for the first, I would say, from maybe 2012 through 16, until when the Apple Watch finally launched, was trying to find its place. When I was running a startup, there was a buzzword thrown around by marketing uh, firms called quantified fitness, if you remember that. Fitbit was around the... Uh, the Nike fuel band was was out. Uh, there's a whole bunch. Jawbone had their own thing, and the value delivered for everyone was to, in a seamless way, capture your motion in order to tell you how well you sleep, how fit you were, what you needed. Some some of the better ones would tell you from your from quantifying your motion and activities, tell you what to do to improve your life. That ended up taking off, and that's what set the stage for Apple. There's always, everyone always says, Apple doesn't really come in first, um, with the exception of maybe the iPhone. And even that, you can argue, BlackBerry and other devices, the Trio um, sort of preceded it. But they always try to find, they do a lot of market research and try to find the best value for the user. So wearables want to sort of just classify in different categories. Uh, there, there are obviously other use cases outside of quantified fitness, tempering, pairing up with uh, IoT, Internet, uh, Internet of Things sensors in order to tell a worker in real time or near real time you know, what an alert could be. Uh, and so you'll find oil and gas, manufacturing, anyone who you know, makes, moves, markets, um, any object or widget, uh, they, they, a lot of these industries have started looking at wearables in order to under, you know, allow, allow the, the end user to understand or the worker to, to, to understand what's happening around them or what's happening with the thing they're working on. And it's something that you don't hear about a lot. Mm-hmm. Another industry you brought up, body cams. And I've got a lot to say about that. Cause oh, please do. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> another vertical for, for wearables uh, have been surveillance, right? So and black folks like me uh, normally get the, 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 the you know, the, the worst end of the stick for being roped up into uh, being captured, being mistreated, sometimes, unfortunately, being killed yeah. with wearables. And so I'll go back into my story mode. So I'm, a sto- I'm an African, so I, we tell stories about everything. Go ahead, brother. Uh, you had talked about what I was doing at the nonprofit National Democratic Institute, and I was kind of vague. Uh, what I did right around the time where GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation in, in the EU, went into effect, I was at NDI then, and I helped them and other major nonprofits move to focus on data privacy and data governance and data, good data stewardship through technology. And so you might be thinking, how, what does that have to do with Google Glass or body cams, right? The story is back in my LengthFit days, I traveled a lot. I was in an accelerator in San Francisco, uh, Momentum Accelerator, former Y Combinator founders uh, decided to spin off and do their own thing. And on one of those travels, um, here I am, I, I go through the airport, I'm putting my bag up in the plane, and I'm about to sit down. The second I sat down, the flight attendant walks up to me uh, and says, take off that thing. And I go, wait, what? And she goes, you're making our, 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 our customers uncomfortable. And I'm thinking to myself, I didn't say this out loud because it was in the moment. I'm like, what is going on? Uh, I'm like, they, whoever's complaining has just gone through an airport. Hmm. Right. Like how many cameras, you know, scanners, all kinds of stuff that I don't even know about have they gone through? And they're worried about a black dude sitting down with a face computer, a Google Glass device. This is BS. Right. So 
at the time I just took it off, but I'd failed to try to explain to her that like, if I were to record her, like through my face, I'd have to be staring at her the whole time. Mm-hmm. And that would make me uncomfortable because I'm not a sociopath, right? And this thing doesn't stay recording because it's a tiny device. I would run out of battery before I got to my destination. None of that mattered. She asked me to take it off. All right, fine. But in that moment, I was also thinking about so many other privileged folks that had Google Glass. I got mine for free, so (laughs) (laughs) I was partnered with Google at the time. We We were doing very well. But in that moment, I started thinking about Folks in on the BART in San Francisco getting beat up or slapped, and uh, I hear the same thing when folks put iPod, uh, the, the the not the iPod, but the the Apple headphones or the, the, the earbuds, AirPods. The AirPods, yeah, thank you. And then like a lot of people just start talking smack about that uh, about that stuff. So a lot of people were hated with Google Glass, and so I started thinking, it's like, what is this anxiety about glass? Like, why do people concern themselves about me, a, a person just like you, potentially recording, even if I was not, versus the government or law enforcement officer recording them. It's okay to be, go through an entire airport experience being recorded, but it's not okay for me to do it. it re, I'm, in that moment, I realized it's not about surveillance. It's about surveillance. It's about me and you, normal people walking around, recording it. Mm-hmm. And I say that because... We don't have these devices that we wear. Normal people don't have the right. The the companies that make these devices don't have the right ethics normally uh, Mm -hmm. when it comes to protecting people's privacy. And so if I don't trust where Google is going to send this data and I don't trust and I don't understand how the device works and I have no control to say, no, I don't want to be on camera. Note that that story that I said about that flight attendant, as I was explaining it to her, every single person around me had their phones out recording that whole account <laughs> thinking I was about to get brawling, right? Like, so it wasn't about that. It was, it was something deeper, which actually diverted my attention to, to data privacy and data governance a little bit. But I'll come back to body cams here in a second. And so what I wanted to basically understand is how these companies could be better stewards of people's data, whether they're hardware devices, creating cameras on things like Snap or whatever, asking them three questions. Do you provide enough context that is easily readable for, for you know, normal people to understand what's happening with your device, Google or whoever, Facebook? Are you capturing any information and selling that data, Facebook? You know, those kind of questions. So do you have enough context? Secondly, do you give normal, your audience, your, your market, a choice to act on that context, right? And once they have the choice to do that, do they have the, the control to act on that choice, right? So it's context, privacy policy that's easily readable, control, and choice. Now, I made that my mission. Like I, like for two years at NDI, Anything that we built, especially for at-risk women in Cambodia or wherever, we wanted to make sure that that data remained true, that that data was contextual, that what we're going to do with it, uh, that we gave folks the choice to opt out and gave them the context uh, to do so. So that's sort of setting the stage for where we are today. You'll notice that some police agencies uh, around Uh, mostly police agencies around the country conveniently have situations where the device doesn't work or it wasn't turned on when they know they're about to do something different. Mm -hmm. I I think that lack of transparency and that lack of context around that is what makes people like me, black folks, untrustworthy whether they're wearing a a body cam or not. Because Mm -hmm. I don't think that they follow their own governance and stewardship with that data, because that data normally just disappears when Mm -hmm. we need most. And what's sad is that there is good that comes out of body cams. It changes behavior when you know you're on camera and you are the person with the weapon looking to protect and serve. But when you lean on that shroud of, oh, we're just going to delete this, uh, right? 
that body camera does not matter. I'm just going to just do my bidding. I'm just going to just keep doing, just killing black folks because I fear them. You know, yeah. when, when a, a 12 year old takes off because they don't trust you, you're going to pull your weapon, conveniently turn off the camera and say, well, it wasn't working. And this is what happened. He was the aggressor. She was the aggressor. Mm-hmm. So I don't know where to go with this, but I, I just wanted to say that there is a paradox with how society addresses camera-based wearables. We're distrusting of surveillance, and we're also distrusting of surveillance because we have no idea, we have no context. We know that that whatever is captured won't benefit us in the case of surveillance. If I'm walking through an airport and I got mugged, my mom at BWI in Baltimore accidentally flashed a, a bunch of uh, cash when she was looking to pay someone to help that helped her with her bags this was years ago, back in the 90s. And she's never been back to BWI because as she put her handbag on that, that desk in order to sort of check in, her bag disappeared. The entire bag disappeared. Oh. I, we have no idea what happened. We believe the, the, the attendant behind the thing was in on it. Uh, it like It just disappeared. This was money that she was traveling with. It was uh-huh. all gone, thousands of dollars, all gone. Wow! And so that's why I, for one, are, I'm I'm shaped by this because it's I'm distrusting when it comes to surveillance. It benefits one side, the enterprise, the company, the Facebooks, you know, and their uh, beneficiaries and stakeholders. Yeah. But it doesn't affect both of us, you and I, right? And so, sorry, I'm going to leave it there. I, I, I could go on. <laughs> yeah. So. That's where I wanted to anchor on a little bit. With no, no, I'm so glad that you brought up the concept of surveillance. It's actually something that, so for one of the, the podcasts that I do at Glitch, or that I've worked with at Glitch, is called Function with Anil Dash, who's the CEO. And we were going to do a whole episode this past season about surveillance. Maybe we'll get to it in the next season. But the interesting thing like about surveillance is that it sort of demonstrates like this defiance against surveillance because... You know, while the many are watching the few, the few are also watching the many, like in that kind of way. But like you said, you know, in order to truly kind of disrupt it, then what does it mean to to hold on to that that data? Like, is the data encrypted? The data can easily be removed or, you know, like you said, other things can happen because of the data that you get from that. So it's such a it's such an interesting concept, I think, especially now when we look at like stores that are starting to use starting to use surveillance. Like I know Amazon has these convenience stores, I think called like Amazon go stores or something like that, where the stores are not really manned. You just kind of walk in with your phone and you grab the stuff that you need. And you just, you just check out without having to interact with any humans. I almost kind of feel like now in this age of COVID that that might start being the norm in a way, but like there's a lot of surveillance that has to go into that. I mean, of course there's the just digital tech of, you know, reading the packages and, and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, what's to prevent someone from going in there and cleaning out the whole store? Right. Right. And they even, like with every piece of technology, I've been in emerging tech for so long that I know that there's value and there, you know, unfortunately we're human. So folks are always going to exploit tech in order to benefit themselves. Uh, and and so, so normally that's harming. There's going to be a confluence of, regulations that are going to have to go in place. And hopefully this movement of folks who are hypersensitive about, you know, their data is going to talk to their wallets, right? These companies' wallets. And, and, and the market is going to judge whether they fail, or I'm hoping, fail or succeed in the market based on, on how good they are with our data. And so if the, the benefit for the Go store would be not necessarily to put you know, a store clerk out of business, but to allow the store clerk at scale to do more personable things that humans are good at, like just to be out in the world to help out uh, folks that may be having a hard time trying to pick a pick between, you know, Dove or whatever the competitor of Dove is. So, right. You know, things like that. I have anxiety when I walk into a store, right. Whether it be a go store or not, like I just don't know where things are. So being able to use technology to help me out. But at the same time, as you said, folks are going to exploit it. Uh, There's this old adage that I use in my talks 
where I talk about the proverbial caveman or cavewoman who invented fire, right? Like they strike two rocks together and, uh, you know, they start fire and everybody's all excited, you know, jumping around the fire. Like, how do you do that? And before they run back to the village, you know, one person who wants to exploit the technology grabs a rock, knocks over the person who invented it over the head and, uh, you know, runs to the, to, to the village and says, oh, look, I invented fire. Now, what that story, and it's a fake story, I obviously don't know, but I tell that story to, to just explain a, a, a simple construct to that. The technology in that story is uh, a rock, right? And fire is the benefit, is the outcome of striking two rocks together. You can use that to burn down the village <laughs> or, or knock somebody upside their head, but uh, you can also use that to change lives. And you can imagine where, you know, fire or lights has, has sort of shaped the world that we live in today. And so we give Facebook, I get, I tear Facebook a new one. I, I, I love the people that work there, but the, the leadership and, and where things go, I give them a hard time. But in times like this, in this pandemic, I, I'm not on Facebook, but I see the value of being connected when you can't physically <laughs> go see somebody, right? So it's, it's very important to weigh that. And hopefully the market sort of rewards or, or punishes uh, companies that take our data for granted. What keeps you motivated and inspired these days? I mean, it, what I get just from our conversation is that you're definitely like a futurist. Like you're looking to see how we can take emerging tech and use it to help like create more equitable futures. But what is it that keeps you inspired to continue with that work? Wow. Um, to do, just to center it with this whole COVID situation, uh, what keeps me motivated is that a lot of the technology that may have been laughed off as, you know, a toy or, or something that's not serious uh, is perhaps one of the most important, uh, some of the most important technologies that we can depend on today. If you remember just not too long ago, the concept of video calls, mm -hmm. that is something that companies had come and go, had, had been born and died trying to make work. Teleconferencing was always promised and lots of companies failed at it. Hangouts failed. Google yeah. Plus, uh, the, the video integration and in Hangouts failed. It's only until recently that once the value and the trend of remote work started going into place and then accelerated by this at pandemic, uh, uh, sort, of, sort of saw the value. I'll give you another example of other technologies that motivate me, right? Every person with an iPhone or a Android, modern Android device or uh, Apple Watch or, or Android, and the two people who use Android watches, me being included, uh, <laughs> often have contactless payments, right? Sort of that NFC, secure NFC feature. So another tech, another piece of technology in this time, in these tough times that motivate me are mobile wallets and point of sale systems that are touchless. So I don't have to really exchange cash. I don't have to touch cash. I don't even have a wallet. So I'm just sort of just going through, but you know, you can think about it uh, from a couple months ago, years ago, what have you. And that was, nobody used that. Uh, I would love to see the trajectory of, of usage starting from this year. Another one would be say connected fitness hardware, Peloton. Peloton came out with a commercial. Oh yeah. <laughs> A couple months ago. Super Bowl. And, yeah, Super Bowl ad, and everybody was making fun of it. But I, it was me, everybody was making fun of it until you couldn't go to the gym, right? Yep. Like now you could swing it, you'd probably get a Peloton and, and sort of socially work out through that connected fitness software. Now they get the last laugh. Right. <laughs> Voice assistants like, you know, the, 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 the Alexa and the Google Home, that kind of stuff. Yeah. HomePod. Like, I think about people who are who lack mobility, uh, who are sick in bed, who you know are stricken by this COVID thing. You know they can't get up, they can't go and and, and turn on the light, or they can't you know you know turn on the TV, that kind of stuff. But just speaking to a thing, what used to be an inanimate object, uh, now brings 
some sort of assistance to them through these assistants baked into these things. So like, uh, this is just some examples, right? Like the, what motivates me about like where things are that things that may have been laughed at as with any technology, I don't know who to attribute this to. Every good idea starts out as a joke until people start seeing value in it. Yeah. Right. And <laughs> I, I used to say this uh, when I was running a startup, because I'd get that a lot, like, well, Google, Google class, make it. Uh, right. Especially when when months had passed and hadn't dropped in price, I would always say society or the market won't use it if they don't see value in it. But contradict, you know, as a paradox, they also won't see value in it if they don't use it. Right. And it takes like at a situation like this where you have to use something in order to see value in it. So uh, that's where we are today. And that motivates. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? Like what kind of work? do you want to be doing? I'm at this moment, the way I, who knows is the short answer, but I see a lot of reward uh, with helping folks and where I am currently at Ventera is, is definitely rewarding in that sense uh, with a lot of the projects that they work on. Uh, so I definitely see myself there unless I get bitten by the startup bug again uh, with an idea that I can prove will work. And so yeah, five years is probably too short of a horizon. So, so yeah, I'll probably still be doing that altruistic BS that I was talking about before. <laughs> well, just to kind of you know wrap things up here, where can our audience find out more about you and about your work online? Uh, I am on Medium. I try to post once a month, but I've been lacking lately. So medium.com slash at Noble Ackerson. That's my full name, N-O-B-L-E-A-C-K-E-R-S-O-N. I'm also on Twitter by same name, Noble Ackerson. Uh, you'll see me just cross post stuff to Twitter and then distribute it to Medium where there's a paywall. So a lot of people don't see it. So I also put it on my website, which is nobles.page. So nobles.page as in webpage. All right. Sounds good. Well, Noble Ackerson, I want to thank you just so much for for coming on the show. I mean, I sort of had an idea just based off of your bio, like, oh, these are the things I want to talk about. But I was really not prepared for how both wide and deep this conversation went in terms of not just your own story and like your personal motivations behind emerging tech, but also just your thoughts on how these technologies are affecting our society. I mean, we're in a time right now where we're all going through this shared collective experience of the pandemic and lockdown and the you know downturn of the economy and stuff. And tech kind of seems to be the one industry that is, I don't want to say flourishing in light of it, but it seems to be doing pretty well or at least coming up with new innovations. And so to hear your thoughts on not just where we are, but where we can go with these things, I think is is really inspiring. And I'm, I'm so glad to have had you on the show to talk about this so people can really see your expertise in this subject matter. So thank you again so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Big, huge thanks to Noble Ackerson. And of course, thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Noble and his work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. And of course, thanks to our sponsor for this episode, Facebook Design. To learn more about how the Facebook Design community is designing for human needs at unprecedented scale, please visit facebook.design. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. Are you looking for some creative consulting for your next project? Then let's do lunch. Visit us at yepitslunch.com. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me, Maurice Cherry, with engineering and editing by RJ Basilio. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre, with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. So what did you think of this episode? Hit us up on social media, on Twitter or Instagram, or even better, by leaving us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. I'll even read your review right here on the show. As always, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.